Thank you very much. It's an uh, extreme pleasure to be here. I think there's a distinguished panel that you'll all enjoy listening to what they have to say. But I'll open up some remarks here with regards to the kinds of things we think about in Indian country about water. Our water is a spirit. It's not a spigot. And so there's a difference there when you are involved in the life of a community about what water means. And so when this issue of Standing Rock came up, it wasn't necessarily about Standing Rock specifically. It was about all sovereign nations that have a sovereign right for water, their land, and their people. And we aren't another group. We're a sovereign nation. So we're not Kiwanis. We're not a farmer's group. So I think having said that as about being sovereign, that the, this current administration has not confronted a sovereign nation so far, and I think that they will with some of the, the strength coming from Standing Rock and the 557 tribes that are out there. <clears throat> and it, it reminds me of a situation where uh, Native Americans always seem to be coming up short and being inundated or being suppressed. Well, when, when George Custer left Washington, D.C., he was part of the Department of Army, which is the predecessor of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So when he left Washington, he said, don't do anything till I get back. And that's what's happened. Our trustee and everything is that supports tribal trust is, is not there. So it's come full circle 100 years later to where sovereign tribes and sovereignty is very much a paramount thought with our tribal leadership. And when Dave R. Shambo and the others at Cheyenne River stood up to their situation re regarding the Army Corps and the DAPL, they said, no, you, we're not, we're not going to let you do this anymore. And the background is there are several dams built on the Missouri River. And you can see some of those up on the slide here. They should be marked in red. But those areas aren't necessarily an opportune place for a dam to be built. It just so happened that those are Indian reservations. There was the least amount of resistance from the people because the government, the BIA, was our trustee and said, yeah, go ahead and do that. So this was in the 40s. And so I know people today that moved out of their homes when the water came in the door. So it's not that far back in history that the tribal members were forced off the river bottom lands where they had lived for centuries, able to keep care of themselves and their families. So the, the issue with Standing Rock, the DAPL, was not a brand new one. In fact, uh, several years ago, the Army Corps of Engineers drew down the lake there, Lake Oahe, and put the intake pipes out of the water, and so Standing Rock did not have any water for their community. So it had serious ramifications about operating the Missouri River without consultation of the tribes. There's a government-to-government -government relationship that's required by the federal government and tribal government. And that is not always acknowledged. So when we stepped up and said, the 28 tribes on the Missouri River said, wait a minute, we need to know what's going on with this river. So we established what's called a programmatic agreement. And that agreement, promoted and signed by the Army Corps, was to allow the tribes to participate in the decision-making process of the Missouri River. Well, when DAPL showed up, that did not happen. They didn't do a normal NEPA. They didn't do a normal EIS. They just didn't do those things. And so that's why it's so important that Standing Rock and all the other tribes along the river have stepped up to be sovereign and say, wait, we're, we're tired of having our people suppressed and pushed around, and you can't do this anymore. So we're going to see how this plays out. It's interesting uh, that we're going to have, going forward, some real dialogue going on because there are treaty rights and sovereign rights at, at hand. And when one nation like Standing Rock, for example, or even my tribe, the Northern Arapaho, when we step up on issues that are paramount to us, there's 550 other sovereigns that immediately become our lobby, immediately become our support, and immediately become of like mind to protect our rights that we have. So 
as we move forward, that creates a lot of jurisdictional issues and concerns that the tribes can take care of themselves in a government-to-government -government relationship that we need to have today. And along those same lines, we're developing capacity for our youth because of all of our strong efforts that we're doing should not go for naught when we pass on. We should have a cadre of young people coming behind us and stepping into the shoes like I think happens here at Rally. Everybody has somebody that they know at home or even their young folks are here to step into the responsibilities that we're looking forward to. <clears throat> the Missouri Basin is a 28 tribe watershed, probably the largest watershed in the United States, so it affects all of us. We control 50 million acres. So the part that I want to express is when we utilize tribes along a watershed and they come to the table with sovereign rights and jurisdictional superiority, that can very well enhance the watershed where you all live, upstream and downstream. The Asleta Pueblo just south of Albuquerque stepped up and said, wait Albuquerque, we don't want any more of your effluent coming down the Rio Grande because we do our ceremonies with that water. It went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Pueblo came out on top and said, we prevailed here. That caused the city of Albuquerque to spend $500 million to upgrade their water treatment facility. Just a small tribe. <clears throat> and, and that's how we can establish our values about our, our spiritual thinking and our culture by being sovereign and stepping up and say, look, that was wrong. And it went all through the courts to get where it is. But why should we have to go to the Supreme Court? But we do. My tribe had to do the same the Bighorn Water Rights case, and out of that case came the opportunity for me and my tribal members as I was a chairman to develop what we call the Wind River Reservation Water Code. It's not a state code, it's a tribal code. And in that code, there are 16 different priorities, all are equal, about how we protect our water. Spiritual, cultural, domestic, agricultural, fisheries, in-stream flow, all those things. And so we specifically named those in the water code for our control and management. And today it's working. We've been doing it for 25 years. We still get uh, chastised by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but we're, fo we're moving forward and we're managing our own water. So without a lot more detail, I just wanted to lay that framework about sovereignty, about what the tribes can do to help all of your watersheds and to reach out to tribes. Uh, in, the, in their environmental and natural resource communities. Some don't have those, but the point is we have a trust responsibility with the Fish and Wildlife Service and other federal agencies that can assist, but we need your support and your strength just like the tribes can provide for you. So with that, I'll introduce the next speaker. He's an exceptional friend of mine. He's uh, very, very well versed on all issues throughout the world regarding water. He's from a small Caribbean island, so he understands what small populations are all about. He also understands about the discriminatory practices that occur. And most importantly in my mind, he recognizes the sovereignty of the tribes and he supports that wherever he goes throughout the world. And several years ago, we had a conference called Native, Pe Native Lands, Native Peoples. And out of that came a document that we sent to Europe, to Poland, to the IPCC, International Policy on Climate Change. And we had a voice at that meeting. We had a voice at that IPCC meeting. And many times that voice is continued today by Roger, Roger Polarty. Roger? Thank you. It's an honor to be here. So my name is Roger Polwarty, as Gary said. I work for NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Pronounced NOAA. It's not to no avail. It's just to no. Okay. So as we begin to think through the next session, the importance of our connectedness. I'm a scientist at NOAA. I work with Gary on issues surrounding drought. I work on things like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But I also, as with Gary and others in this room, are interested in why 
and how we get to be where we are. We have the 1831 Trust Responsibility of the Global Water Partnership that we work with. The 1942 U.S. Supreme Court decision between Seminole Nation and the U.S., which for the first time really recognized the responsibility that the U.S. has, and me, as a federal scientist, the responsibility that we have to show to our people. But all of this is built around the 1871 decision to end treaty making with the Indian tribes. What I would like us, as we lead into this discussion about Dakota Access, I, my role here is to give a sense of what's happening in Indian country. Outside of that region, you have the experts who are here, and those of us who have supported you around the country while this was going on. And really to give a sense of what else is happening in the world, and what does that mean for consent? We hear this in the UN agreements. Consent, not assent, but consent. You know, there's an old saying, that God answers your prayers and sometimes the answer is no. The answer can be no to consent. So it is important that we begin to understand this. Gary, let me know when I have about an hour to go. What is it that we're speaking about? According to the UN Development Program, indigenous peoples own, occupy, or manage up to 65% of the Earth's land surface. But more than 80% of all of these lands lack legal protection and are vulnerable to displacement of the peoples in those lands. To meet the global conservation goals that we all describe, we need to protect about a million square miles. That doesn't come easy. As we begin to talk more about Dakota Access, there's something else that we're learning. When someone says, why are you worried about this because it is not on your property? It's a view of property that does not take into account the way we're impacted by the world. If, as a scientist, I were not worried about the pollution that comes from other parts of the country and the nation into the U.S., we would be remiss. And our satellite imagery suggests that protection of indigenous lands contributes substantially to maintaining both the carbon stocks and improving water quality around the lands that are hosted by indigenous people on which they live. Whenever I go to a tribal meeting, I always introduce myself, like if we, we're hosting it, I say, welcome to your own land. So despite a growing recognition of the relevance of local knowledge systems, there's a tendency to validate these through only scientific knowledge. And one of the things is we begin to ask, and we want to engage people in thinking through this problem, is why, in spite of knowing all of these things, aren't we acting and doing better? We hear issues surrounding an investment of a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. But our projections basically show that half of what you will see, and that's for the young people in the room, not people like me and Gary, half of what you will see in 2030 has not yet been built. You have the position and time to shape what that looks like. There's everything from surface transportation to water resource projects to broadband internet and oil or gas pipelines. As I said, notification is not consent. Several tribes that we've sampled and talked about around the world have said that the agencies reach out to tribes for consultation only if the the tribe's present-day land holdings are impacted. This is not an indigenous view of nature, a practice that ignores a tribe's connection, ties, and the rights they have in ancestral homelands and their ceded territories is a limited view. So how do we ask, what is happening in Indian country? Gary, this is a quote from Gary, with drought, tribes are the first affected and most affected. They are the ones on the ground who sustain themselves with subsistence hunting, fishing and gathering, and gardening. My responsibility is to ask, who cares? Who cares if Alaska melts? Well, the people that live there. The threats to cultural and subsistence activities, the threats to habitation, and the things that we're seeing in the desert southwest, where during drought, tribal members are now visiting flower shows to find ceremonial plants because the pockets that they used to go to that are part of knowing the wise places, as they're called, are disappearing. 
So these are important. They're important for every citizen of the US and everyone in the world. As people in this room know this Rolling Thunder quote pretty well, you can't just sit down and talk about the truth. It doesn't work that way. You have to live it and be part of it, and then you might get to know it. I say you might, because it is slow and gradual, and it doesn't come easy. That is wisdom. I always like to say, being a scientist, the human mind is amazing. You give us a complex problem, and sooner or later we'll solve it. It's the obvious that takes us a long time to figure out. <laughs> so, what we are seeing is the ignorance of cumulative effects of our existing activities or historical activities. But there are people that we have talked to who document this, and people that you know, whose histories are more complex than the science that I do. And they tell us in their observations how the environment is changing. And we've documented these from elders around the country. Because we know the world is made up of physical particles, but humans are made up of their stories. The things we tell about who we are, where we live, and how we learn. The elders in the Four Corners part of our world are telling us that things are changing. The disappearance of cottonwood trees, willows, ceremonial and medicinal plants, and traveling farther to get those things. And then folks from elsewhere come in to find that out. They do what has been called, they borrow your watch to tell you the time. They basically ask you what you're doing and then report back on it. But one of the things Gary was mentioning that comes out of those documented histories is for the first time, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in its recommendation and summary for policymakers, for the very first time, said, indigenous local and traditional knowledge systems, including indigenous people's holistic view, are a major resource for adaptation. But these have not been used consistently. Why is that important to be in these international documents? Because that determines where allocations for funding and for partnerships go. It is the first time that that was actually ever included in the recommendations out of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It took a lot of work to get that because, as people in this room know, countries do not like individual nations to speak on their own behalf. And yet, that battle was drawn out went into several nights just to get the voice of people from whom we have something to learn. The goal there was really to be able to say Native peoples are not helpless. They're impacted. They have resources that have been taken away from them. But they are where they are. I remember working on the Grand Canyon years ago and a friend from Hopi was actually, we were starting up the adaptive management program in the Grand Canyon, and he told the Secretary of the Interior, adapt to what? We've been here for 10,000 years. You guys just showed up. <laughs> so let's think through, I'm going to wrap up, what this actually means. He also said something, which is I asked him how the rain dance works. He's a rain priest. And me was, you know, well, which, who are you calling? And he said, the key to a successful rain dance is timing. Do it before it rains. So, where are the lessons? We have lessons from Bolivia, from the people in Fiji, from the people in Kenya, and they all look, believe it or not, just as the world in capitalism and economics looks to the US, they look to tribal peoples in the US for guidance and for thought about how indigenous peoples can help lead this response to a changing environment. So I want us to keep that in mind, and these are well documented, and whoever's interested in reading any of those, we can, we can talk about them. Tribes have acknowledged the importance of infrastructure to their economies and for economic development. But more than anything, they want to preserve dignity like every human does. That's where free, prior, and informed consent comes in. The right to choose your own future, and that that be informed. Tribes and agencies have had examples in which we've worked together, and I can name a whole lot of those, including some partnerships I've had with Gary, and a bunch of other places in which we've been able to make these partnerships work under the conditions stipulated by tribal communities. Positive examples. 
and we can draw from those. But what does this mean for free, prior, and informed consent? It is the right of indigenous peoples to participate in the conduct of the impact assessments that affect their lives. As I was told once, if you are doing something for me without me, you are against me. And we sort of know that we ought, there's inclusiveness. We know to speak that language now. We put it in our agreements, but yet in practice, it actually is not realized. So just to wrap up, before we get to the, you know, the stars of the show, I wanted to just give you a little bit of the background from everywhere around the world, from Fiji to Kenya to the region I'm from in the Caribbean, from East Africa, outside of Kenya, in Tanzania. The stories are very similar. But yet the rules and laws that people are choosing are made up of the partnerships that you have developed here. They're looking towards the US agreements with their countries on how sovereign nations within a country should function. And I want us to keep that in mind from a leadership perspective. You'd be surprised where I was hearing about Standing Rock when I was in different parts of the world over the last year. But what is it that we're asking people to do? As scientists, as environmentalists, as green business people, we have to realize we are putting pressure on tribal people who are limited in capital and infrastructure. We're demanding the tribes and tribal lands in, are increasingly targeted to meet national and global conservation and climate mitigation goals. But many of these are poor and expected to take on these growing responsibilities without additional resources and help. So we need to work out what does it mean to truly engage with tribes. And for me as a scientist, it means for me to understand the vast amount of cultural, historical, and geographic knowledge that people bring to bear. It means as for me to understand what true objectivity means. It is not just based on my method, but objectivity in its original Greek definition meant bringing all relevant information to bear on a problem. History, tradition, science. Because there are not only different ways of knowing, but tribes can teach us different ways of being. There's a difference between the technical choices and the practical ones that we have to make. And there's only one group amongst us that still feels the rhythm of the seasons and use that for long-term planning. I'm not over-romanticizing the deal here. This is empirical. This is in the data. This is how they think. And this is what we can learn by treating ourselves as common fighters in this cause. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, I think that was so good we need to hear him again. <laughs> There's certain things I'm sure you might have missed one way or the other, but uh, nonetheless, his, uh, his position on, on world affairs with regards to his science background and understanding of the culture of many places really is par paramount, and I'm so pleased to have had him here. Our next speaker is, um, is Lee or excuse me, Levi, and he's uh, with, with tribes in the area and he's been very much uh, a significant factor uh, at Standing Rock. Uh, some of the video that you'll see is actually video that he's, he took himself and he can show you some of the, the paramount things that are going on there in terms of human rights and indignity being infringed upon. So with that, I'll have our next speaker come forward. Thank you. Buju, Mitigwabwak and Dijikas, a Jijak and Dodom, Namanitagong Donjuba, a Machi Banashwich and Dao. Um, hello. <laughs> My name is Lee. Um, I am from the Crane Clan. I am from the territories currently occupied by the state of Michigan. I am from the territories currently occupied by the state of Michigan. Colonialism isn't a one-time event. 
It didn't happen in 1776. It's an ongoing structure, and we're all part of it. Colonialism has the United States having legal control of our lands, our water, our air, our bodies, and our minds. Colonialism is an ongoing structure. It's not a one-time event. Saved. Um, I got out there to Standing Rock in November. Um, I arrived on November the 5th. I was there for four months. Um, I returned here in the month of April. Um, we operated the team that was named out there at Standing Rock called the Michigan Cold Water, uh, Michigan Canoe Cold Water Rescue Team. I didn't make the name up. I like shorter acronyms. But, um, is this all right? Um, this is what I do. My family has been harvesting wild rice for many, many years, my children and I, and I have the distinct pleasure of actually restoring wild rice into the Kalamazoo River that was destroyed by the Enbridge Tar Sands oil spill seven, seven years ago next month. That's my dream job, to restore that river that was damaged and destroyed by an oil spill. No one should ever have this job again in the history of man. I'm not trying to train nobody. Those are my two children, my youngest two. Oops. There's two of my children after a good morning harvesting wild rice. A lake here by Lake Huron um, on the Tawas River. And um, they got about 40 pounds of wild rice. Now look at their faces. They know what they did for our community and our family. They put food on our table, those two young ones. They're probably uh, 10 and 11 at the time. Actually, they're probably been 9 and 10. They're kind of tall for their age. I don't know where they get it. <laughs> but that's a beautiful lake. And they're doing the same things that we've been doing for eons. I mean, this, this last ice age 10,000 years ago, we've been through climate change. On November the 6th, the day after I arrived, I don't know if you guys can read that or not, but we arrived there, got some first aid training, what to take to the front lines for eye wash, tear gas, um, fire starting kit. And we were the first four canoes on Turtle Island that day. We turned them right uh, 45 degree angles so we wouldn't get shot by rubber bullets. Um, speed boats were making wakes to sink our canoes. Helicopters were overhead. They weren't that close, but you could feel the propeller of the prop wash. And um, we ended up moving over 200 people to Turtle Island that day in four canoes and a couple other boats that were with us. Not one canoe tipped. I was afraid I was going to fall in the very first time with that dapple boat making speed boat circles and wakes around us. These are some members of the team that worked with us. It was an ever-evolving team. We had some regulars. I don't use a lot of names. There's still some legal issues that are involved. But that's, that's us uh, after doing some nighttime training. People get in trouble in the water at nighttime. On the right, we're getting our canoes checked, and we're going to do some ice drills, thin ice drills. Um, snow was water. We used snowshoes. When nobody could move around or walk or cars couldn't go, we could still walk on the snow. I took three traditional technologies with me to Standing Rock, my canoes, or gemonic, our snowshoes, and toboggans. And I was going to use those things to fight the black snake, and we did. This is a thin ice drill. I'm wearing my NRS uh, dry suit. Anybody have an NRS dry suit? Awesome. We got to talk. They're nice, aren't they? You don't want to go in this water without a dry suit. Nobody operated beyond the capacity of their equipment. So if you had a wetsuit on, you didn't go all the way in. You went to the shore, helped people out. This is when the Morton County Sheriff's Department, could you pull that little curtain back there? Am I missing that there? Anyways, you guys can read it, I think, yeah. Ah, go the other direction. (laughs) 
Yeah, go ahead. That's the Morton County Sheriff Department stole my canoes the day after Thanksgiving on Friday. We had just went over there a second time of about 200 people. Um, so here are the Morton County Sheriff putting razor wires around my canoes. They're standing with my oar that I just found the receipt for last week. About 10 new paddles. I wanted them all to be the same. So they destroyed my canoes and they took trophy pictures over them. Now mind you, I wasn't never charged with a crime. So there's no pretext for taking my personal property. And we were there legally at the camp at the time. And if it was evidence of a crime, evidence handling procedures preclude them from destroying evidence. I went and charged the Morton County Sheriff in their own department with stealing my canoes. Walked right into their offices and charged them. <laughs> this is our Canoe and Kayak magazine. Anybody ever read it? Okay. They did, I think it might have been on the online version, I'm not sure, but they did a thing called the Canoes and Kayaks of Standing Rock. And um, they took, uh, they found my canoes. They found them before I did. I saw them the first night when the veterans got there, then they disappeared. Um, they were down by the Cannonball River and the bridge, I believe, um, by the South Gate. The bridge is right to the left of that picture. Um, when I saw them, they were completely frozen in the ground under uh, snow banks. So I didn't unbury them until two days before the end of Standing Rock, Rosebud, and Sacred Stone. Those are my canoes, those three. That red one is the one that my children were harvesting rice in. This is really hard for me to do, okay? Not because of those canoes, the physical part of them, but for what they did for our people, what they did for the Kalamazoo River, and what my children have been able to learn in them. So that's the, um, that's Rice Daddy one, the top one. That middle one is Winona, and that uh, bottom canoe is a 17-foot Grumman, and we call that the um, um, uh, Chimokamon, or the long knife, because it's metal, the long knife canoe. Chimokamon is our word for white man, because when they came with the bayonets, they had long knives on the end of them. So Chimokamon, it sounds like mon, but anyways, long knife. So that canoe is called Chimokamon, or the long knife canoe. This is a picture I took when I put my camera through the razor wire at the Morton County Sheriff. I actually wanted to get as close as I could to those guys. There's a lot of pictures from this night. I, I, I couldn't boil everything down for four months of filming into this presentation, but um, that bottom right-hand one is me when I turned around my back to the soldiers. Um, not this particular sequence, but shortly afterwards when I was hit by a rubber bullet. Right there. That's a, um, a rubber shotgun shell encased in rubber. Um, most of the people in my canoe team were hurt worse than I was that night. I was hit by rubber shotgun pellets, water cannons for four to five hours. My braids were stiff, like straight out, could pick them up. Um, long range acoustical devices, when they hit them, your ears hurt. I saw everybody in the crowd drop down simultaneously. I turned around, I was like that too. I turned around and everybody behind me had dropped down because of the acoustical devices that they aim at you. The same ones the US military used in Fallujah for crowd control. Go back to there. Um, flashbang grenades, concussion grenades were being fired at us, lobbied at us. Um, tear gas canisters, I don't know how many tear gas canisters. Um, I went through four gas masks that night. Four, you can't use them forever. They get used. So that evening I went through four gas masks. Thank you, Morton County Sheriff. As a result of that night, we developed, this was originally a place where we could keep our neoprene wetsuits at temperature in 30 to 40 below zero temperatures in the middle of the winter in North Dakota. You can't put on a neoprene suit if it's frozen. It'll break. That was originally why I bought those shelters there, to store our equipment and then to get them up to temperature so we could get suited up to go to the water. Um, we quickly redesigned them to be mass hypothermia um, event sh shelters. My goal is to get a Homeland Security grant to teach the Morton County Sheriff how to handle mass hypothermia events. We've done that, us and everybody else at Standing Rock. 
The Morton County Sheriff has only experience putting people in jeopardy for mass hypothermia. But we had to figure out a way to get 10 to 20 people inside that ice shelter. Out of the wind, we can put that up in three minutes. You see us practicing on the Missouri River, bottom left-hand side. We did it at nighttime, we did it in the wind, we did it in the winter, it's cold. We were motivated to get it up because then we could jump on the inside, put on a Mr. Buddy heater, and within three minutes I'm in a t-shirt. So we had motivation to jump inside that thing and stay warm ourselves. And then that's the ice shelter in the bottom that we set up the day before the camp fell, the main camp. We then took that shelter apart in a few minutes, moved it by toboggan across the river, and set it up in Rosebud. And we had two steel cables going across, and we had um, mountain climbers and carabiners and ice ropes, the kinds that don't freeze and when they get wet in the cold weather. We were prepared. This is the first shelter I lived in, a wind and solar powered, wood fired, wood heated teepee. There's uh, one of the solar panels. The bots far left, you'll see one of the blue shelters, and then that uh, white structure is called a tarpy a teepee that's made out, of, made out of tarps, two by four. It's pretty reasonable, easy to make. I think I know somebody who brought that wreath over to the, Amy Yee actually sent that wreath over there to us in Standing Rock. Um, there's our wind turbine, and that's the inside of one of our ice shells. After we set it up, we put down, we take a bale of hay, put it on the ground, bust the wires out, put a tarp, another bale of hay, another tarp. We're using two inch pink foam insulation, too messy, too bulky, little pink things all over the place, so we had to spend a long time to pick it up. Two bales of hay and some tarps, and we can put a uh, floor in that shelter and be very warm. We didn't live outside in the wintertime. We lived inside nice shelters, warm. We had a solar-powered buggy that operated the far right side. The Zynoc buggy. Some of you guys might know Brad Callio. But that buggy was actually, you know, young people went on dates in that solar-powered buggy, okay? And at the very end, before the um, Sacred Stone camp fell, we got it fixed up again, and we took the young children of Standing Rock on rides in that solar-powered buggy because they had to have the experience. They had to have that experience. If we're going to get off oil, we have to have an alternative. So we went there to fight the black snake, use our traditional technologies, and use the future technologies that are going to get us off that black oil pipeline. And we're going to fight that stake using those methods. And we did. On the far left side is Brad's wind turbine that spun sideways at the top of Facebook Hill for the longest time up until the second winter storm. When a 10 cent part failed, and then that failed. So that was a lesson learned there too. Um, this is a sacred stone. We were the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth shelters put up. The Michigan tent, a big army tent, blew away in that windstorm and disappeared over the hill. They did find it later. Um, when we came back up there the second time, that blue, that blue shelter had collapsed, and the other one that we were sleeping in, we saw setting it up, was starting to lift away and blow. If I wasn't there at that moment, we would have, I never would have found those shelters, I believe. But it was melting, if you remember, at the end. And we had ice stakes in the ground, the screw kind. We had to go bet really long stakes to stick them in the ground to keep those things um, in there. Fixing a wind turbine. Uh, some of the canoes that were used to carry goods back and forth across two steel cables that we put our carabiners to. Um, I don't know if I can make this one go or not from here. And yeah, that's a cool video. There it is. <laughs> All right, we got some people crossing our ice bridge here. They're crossing over to safety, we hope. So we are approximately half an hour from the deadline. Water is live! Woo! Uh, you can see here one of the canoes uh, was cut in half after it was damaged by the uh, sheriff's department. Uh, police report was filed. 
you see the ice is uh, getting thin in areas, but we are ensuring that this is a safe passage for people. So, all right, that's it for now, folks. And the camp is burning behind me that day, half hour before the deadline. Um, upper left-hand corner is the water protector. For some reason, I walked up there to help him out. Oh, thank you. I thought you were saying you were hungry. <laughs> International food sign. Um, so I'm walking across camp because the raid didn't happen during the deadline. And even though the walkie-talkie has a lot of chatter on it, I have to see to know what's going on. It's really confusing. Um, so I walked across camp, and these are just a couple of the pictures that I took. You know, we had some real discussions about, was this the apocalypse? Had we been in the apocalypse for a while and didn't know it? So we had two discussions that I remember that were absolutely real in the context that they were being taken. We did not know if this was the apocalypse or not. That, that short guy there, he's pulling up his left-hand side. I thought he was going to shoot me with a gun. He has a, um, looks like a taser or a tear gas canister or something. Um, but there was one guy up there by himself, and I just went up there to see if I could help him out. This is, um, you can see, the Cold Water Rescue Team headquarters on the bottom right-hand side on the wood. I saw that from up on the, where the guy was going to, the yellow canister, I guess. I only saw two of our tarpies, and we had three of them. I, I was on the other side of that one, so the, it looked like there was two of them, but as you can see, the back side of it had burned already uh, by the time I got there. And we had three people there that I was concerned about. Hadn't I left to go check on those people, I would have been arrested with 47 other water protectors minutes after that guy told me um, to stop filming. Actually, I was taking pictures. He said, stop filming. So that's when I started filming, and that's a longer video some other time. This is when I started approaching him. Um, that's the one lone water protector with the beanie on the right-hand side that was by himself. Um, he was having a parlay with them. They were negotiating terms. If you stayed on the road, you'd get arrested with a misdemeanor. If they arrested you in the camp, it would be a felony trespass against the governor's orders, and depending on how you acted, additional felony charges would be levied against you. So immediately after they told us that, I went into the camp. Um, this is Bill McKibbins at the Mackinac Straits. The Enbridge oil pipeline, number five, crosses right there. And Enbridge owns 28% of the Dakota Access Pipeline. There we are setting up our ice shelter at the Mackinac Bridge, just uh, maybe last weekend or the weekend before. Um, our team has been going up there, scouting it out, seeing what's going on, looking at water access. And who knows where this is? Look familiar? That's right downtown Grand Rapids at the, uh, the Calder. The Alexander Calder, they're down here in the plaza, about two blocks away, three blocks away or something. We're just making the point, and this is a longer video too, but I think it took us 42 seconds to pop that shelter up because we've been practicing. If we can do it in North Dakota in the wintertime, we can do it here. If we can build a renewable eco-city with snipers overhead in 35 degree warm uh, temperatures below zero and 40 to 50 to 60 mile an hour gusts, we can build that here when we have the luxury of time. But we did that under those conditions. And when I say we, it was all of us. People that were in camp, but people that were supporting us. You know, the, the, the Morton County Sheriff had a logistical team behind them. Hundreds of taxpayers, people in the military supplying them. We had you. And for that, I really want to thank you. Because whatever you think that we did there, none of it would have happened without you. You know, so thank you very much. I'm going to read to you, um, I'm going to close this out here. I think this might be my last slide. Yeah, that's my last slide. This is, um, I wrote this, you need to know that the main camp of Chetty Sokoan fell to the Morton County Sheriff and the, and the North Dakota State Highway Patrol. And the other camp, the Rosebud Camp and the Sacred Stone Camp fell to the Bureau of Indian, Care, Indian Affairs and the Standing Rock Tribe itself. Uh, Chairman Dave Archambault actually evicted us from the other two camps. And you might not know that. 
but we were forced out of the other two camps by the um, Standing Rock Lakota tribe itself and Chairman Dave Archambault. And as a former chief of a tribe, I felt that I was privileged enough to write a letter to him. I do use Indian, Indian chief privilege, you know. You don't hear about that too much. Um, but I'm going to read this to you. It's an open letter to Dave Archambault of the great Standing Rock Sioux Nation. How do I get this stuff out? Here it is. To Dave Archambault of the great Standing Rock Sioux Nation. Never shoot sideways or backwards into your own ranks when in an Indian fight. Your job is to keep the enemy in focus, describe the consequences of non-action, and keep the people focused on the real enemy. The water protectors who you asked to come to your side to fight for clean water, peace, and love came to your side, and now you are going to throw them out, evict them in a manner similar to the North Dakota oil police and mercenaries. As I write this, you are blockading the Sacred Stone camp and the Rosebud camp and the Great Cheyenne River Nations camp, whose leader is focused on the real enemy, the black snake and protecting water for the seventh generation rights to a clean environment for their seventh generation. The Standing Rock Nation's elected leaders are about to deliver to the water protectors, who they summon to their side, a measured dose of internal colonialism. And forced we remove the camps with the assistance of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the BIA, and a blockade similar to the one experienced just a couple of days ago. Other federal authorities, including the National Park law enforcement officers who go to all the places that we love. When I see those guys here at, at Sleeping Bear Dunes, it sends a chill up my spine. The same law enforcement officers that backed up Dave Archambault to throw out the Sacred Stone camp and the Rosebud camps. Other federal authorities you have authorized will be participating and supporting the forced removal of water protectors from your lands. This does not include the great peoples of the Standing Rock Nation, many of them who are in support of the water protectors and who have sought shelter and refuge in the reservation areas under your leadership. History has a way of remembering those who fire into their own ranks in an Indian fight. And you, dear sir, will be remembered by your seventh generation. I would have thought that history, your own history of leaders, siding with the colonizers, the United States of America, against their own people would guide your footsteps. We water protectors live for the well wishes of the seventh generation, fighting for clean water, peacefully with love and great dignity. What will your seventh generation of children think of your actions today, Mr. Archambault, forcing the removal of many nations and peoples and allied water protectors? Remember the youth of your nation, the great peoples of the Standing Rock, started this movement. Good luck with your history in the long role of his resistance on Turtle Island. You will be remembered, as will the water protectors, and our shared seventh generation will be the ones who carry on all of our works into the living memory of their seventh generations. Real warriors, dear sir, Mr. Archambault, will ride into the front lines backwards on their horse to distract the enemy, not fire backwards and sideways into their own ranks. Love and peace to you, dear sir, chairman of the great Standing Rock peoples. So that happened. And what you need to know was Sitting Bull was killed by the BIA police on Standing Rock by his own peoples. And when that happened, they fled the Cheyenne River, almost identical to what happened this time. So history did repeat itself. So you need to know that, that Sitting Bull was killed by his own people at Standing Rock, by the BIA police, just like the BIA police under Dave Archambault from Standing Rock were there. And when they routed us, people fled the Cheyenne River after those pictures. Just like Sitting Bull's followers fled the Cheyenne River after the events that cost him his life. So there's a long arc in history, and this will be remembered. Um, so with that, I want to thank you for indulging me. It was very difficult and emotional to go through four months of footage to come up with these 28, 29 slides. So, Chi Miigwech. Oh.
Thank you, Lee. Very inspiring comments. Uh, very much on track with what Roger had to say about sovereignty, tribe's position, and the time to step up and do something. Under all the adversity that we have with the federal government, and I'm speaking particularly of the BIA. So that's our challenge, to move forward and, and to see what we can do, much more than we have in the past on our own. And we're not looking for assistance and a crutch, we're looking for support and understanding for our people and where we're going and where we need to go. With that, and our next speaker is John, which many of you know. Uh, if he didn't have his camera, you wouldn't recognize him, but he always has his camera. So that, that's a good thing. And so uh, uh, you need to pay attention to what he has to say because he has you on film. <laughs> so with that, I'd appreciate John to come to the podium. Thank you, John. I'm going to follow Lee and get out front here. I can't see that thing. Hello, everybody. My name is John Wathen, and I am your Hurricane Creek Keeper. The reason I tell people that, Hurricane Creek is a waterway of the United States. Each and every one of us own it as a collective, just like the Cannonball River, just like the Missouri River at Standing Rock. These are waterways of the United States, and every one of us have a responsibility to see that that water is clean enough to be used. What does Hurricane Creek... What in the world does Hurricane Creek have to do with Standing Rock? Nothing and everything. The same rules are being broken in my watershed that are being broken at Standing Rock in the eminent domain fight, where they come and take people's land away from them, whether they want to sell or not. They took my land away from me. I fought them for two years. When I finally had to come to the point of settling, I'd already been at Standing Rock for a month. So they give me the check, and I told the Alabama Power Company folks, I'm going to take your money, I'm going to go to Standing Rock, and I'm going to fight eminent domain with this eminent domain check. And that's what I did. <laughs> so I had no idea what I was going to get into when I got up there. I, I, I'm not a pipeline fellow. I don't know anything about it. I know a lot about water quality. I know that... When this Bakken crude hits the water, it's some of the most dangerous crude oil we've ever brought to the surface. This is, this is uh, the most volatile crude that's ever been brought up. It's full of caustic materials. Putting it inside a pipe with H2S gas, methane, propane, and the Bakken crude itself is a recipe for disaster. All of these gases expand when they're agitated. The H2S gas is one of the most corrosive gases known to man. So we are literally pressurizing the pipe while it's eating away the inside of it. It's not a question of will there be a problem. It's when and where will that problem be. And if it's under Lake Oahe, there's a valve on each side to shut off the pipeline flow, but the oil is still under the river leaking. So what do you do about it? How do you fix that? You can't. You can't fix that. We had a train blew up in Aliceville, Alabama, carrying this same Bakken crude down. Uh, there was a 100-car bomb train. The train blew up before it left the tracks. It didn't leave the tracks and then blow up. There was a breach in the tank car that caused a spark, and the cars started exploding. 26 tank cars went off into that swamp over there in Aliceville four years ago. The EPA on site said everything was cleaned up. The director of the Alabama Department of Environmental Maniacs, I mean management, they said that the oil couldn't have gotten away from them because there was a beaver dam at the end of the swamp. Come on, folks. You ever seen a beaver dam? They're smarter than us. They don't try to stop the river. They let it flow through and just impound it. There was oil everywhere. I went out there recently. Four years ago this happened. I went out there recently, and there is still Bakken oil in the sediment when I walk through the swamp, it comes up behind me like a rainbow tail. It followed me all the way through the swamp. It's still there. If it happens under the Ohio River, they don't have the technology to clean this stuff up. Why is it there to begin with? Because the rich white folks in Bismarck 
decided that they didn't want this pipeline above their watershed, above their water intake, because if something happened, it would, con it would contaminate their drinking water. We can't have that. Stick it off down there on the reservation. There's a lot less resistance there. Nobody really cares what's going on on the res anyway. I mean, right? That's how this happened. This is not about an environmental issue. It's a social issue. When one group of people's quality of life is diminished for the sake of profit for somebody else, that's an environmental crime. That's a social crime. And it's got to stop. What we learned at Standing Rock is just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more to come. I had no idea what I was going to get into when I went up there. I did know that I was not going to go and tell those people what to do. I was going to offer my expertise and say, I am a journalist. How can I help you? I moved into the camp. This is where I lived at Standing Rock. I had one of the coolest teepees. I thought I had one of the coolest teepees at Standing Rock till you showed me yours with the solar panels, you know. I had electric lights. I had heat in there. I mean, man, it was nice. It was really nice. There were nights that it would be 30 degrees below zero outside, and I'd be sitting in my teepee in a pair of shorts and T-shirt working. That's how well this technology is, has carried over for the generations. So this is what I wound up getting into. Hello. This is what it looked like when I got there. It was one of the most peaceful scenes I'd ever experienced. It was literally a village taking care of the village. You saw horses coming down to the water. You saw people coming to the river, offering prayers every morning. The, the, the water ceremonies that went on every day. It was a spiritual experience. It wasn't a protest camp. This was a prayer camp. And it stayed prayerful for a long, long time. When the elders were there, we had so many of the elders that, that had been to Wounded Knee and knew what to expect. And they were trying to advise these youth that were so fired up and they wanted to go to war so bad. It was hard to get them to be peaceful. We did, though. We did stay peaceful. For the greatest part, this is what our marches looked like. When we came up the road, we came together. We had our Kichita, our, our security people, telling us, hey, get off the side of the road here. We don't want to block the road. We're not going to break the law. We're going to obey the law. We have the First Amendment right to assemble for the sake of protest. That right, along with our 14th Amendment and other amendments, were trampled on at Standing Rock. It was a disgusting situation. This was the most lawless law enforcement operation I've ever seen in my life. I was raised in Birmingham, Alabama during the race wars in the 60s, and this is very comparison, very comparable to what we went through in the South. Only the prejudice here is far worse if you can still believe that in today's time, the prejudice in North Dakota, South Dakota, and for that fact, around most of our Native American reservations, the prejudice is still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. This is a social issue. Some of you may have seen this photograph. It was in several magazines. It kind of went around the world. That's the first action that I was a part of. Man, when they came down the road, everybody singing. It, it still puts chills on my arm. That was the nature of the protest. That was the nature of the actions. <laughs> this is the first time I got in trouble with the feds up there. Uh, <laughs> you may remember when Jill Stein showed up at Standing Rock. She did not help us. She didn't help us at all. Instead of going to the tribal elders and checking in as a dignitary should have and say, what can I do to help? Jill shows up out on the line and grabs a can of spray paint, starts painting, I approve this message on the side of a bulldozer. People went nuts with the paint cans at that point. I mean, there was nothing out there that didn't have paint on it. So these investigators show up and they're trying to get documentation and they didn't want to trespass, so they had to stay up on the road. And every time this woman would set up to get a picture of some evidence, I got my tripod with my big camera and my microphone on it and I would set up right in front of her. And when she'd move, I'd move. I've got the coolest video clip of she and I dancing up the side of the road like this, you know. <laughs> they put a felony warrant on me. What can I say? Obstruction and a, a federal trespass, criminal trespass. 
When uh, Amy Goodman's charges were dropped, they dropped all of those outstanding federal trespass warrants, and mine was one of them. I was, I was very thankful for that. This was about as violent as it got. Some spray paint. Um, there might have been some, some curse words thrown around, but it wasn't a riot. There was never a riot on our side of the prayer line. The riots were always incited by the police. The violence was always brought by the police. We never incited the first speck of violence. The prayers, the chanupa, these were our weapons. The eagle feathers, when we went to pray, those are the weapons we took. We took spirit things. They came at us with full lethal weapons, less than lethal weapons. They used flash canisters on us. They used CS gas on us. They used everything imaginable. They didn't break our spirit. They can't break our spirit. This is when Jill was there. And uh, you see what's all around her, the eagle feathers, the people. It, it, was, it was what she did that day really kind of uh, set a bad light on all of us. For the next two weeks, all people could talk about was Jill Stein sabotages equipment on a pipeline. It, wasn't any, it, was, it was no longer about the prayer camps. It was no longer about the people's rights being stomped on. But it was beautiful. This is one of the teepees that was set up in, in uh, uh, Sechangu camp, Rosebud camp. That's where I stayed. I always thought or was told when I got there, stay in Sechangu. Sechangu is on federal property. It's on the reservation. They can't come in here and do anything to us. You're safe here. So that's where I put my camp. Little did we know that was not going to be true toward the end of this thing. When, when several tribal members turned against us, all of the camps were in jeopardy. This was the nature of, of one of the protests, one of the actions. We took willows out and we planted them on the pipeline. The willow is a very sacred tree. To put that in ahead of the pipeline with the amount of prayers that we put up that day, the hope was that we could deter this black snake. I'll be honest with you folks. When I went up there, I know the Lakota spirituality, the Dakota people, they're, they're, they're wonderful people who believe strongly in their prayers. But I'm also a white man. And I live in this world. I live in our world too. And I've seen what the government does and I never could bring it, I, couldn't, I never could bring it out of my heart to tell them, you're not going to stop this pipeline. We didn't stop the mechanics of the pipeline, but we created a movement that's now worldwide. Every pipeline in this country right now, there's camps springing up that, that, that were raised on the paradigm of standing rock. We got a lot to learn. Before we call the whole world to come to a camp again, we better damn well be able to have the infrastructure to take care of them. Because that didn't happen at Standing Rock. They called for the world to come and help us. The world came and the infrastructure wasn't there to, help, to, to take care of them. This was at one of the actions and this is the first time I saw them come at us in mass. They came in buses. They brought their heavy equipment. They brought the tanks. When they came across the prairie, you could see them for miles. This is the way they came at us. They unloaded the bus and they marched in a platoon-like formation coming up on the pipeline action that day. There was never any violence. We had a crew there from, uh, from Venezuela, I believe, that was doing a dance, a sacred dance on the pipeline. There were no workers there. No one was being threatened. And this is the force they came after us with. That's, that's what the action looked like on the pipeline. Way up at the top of the hill, you'll see one piece of machinery up there by itself. There's a, there's a young warrior that's chained or, or, or uh, shackled underneath that machine to lock it down so they can't work. We were holding our end of the action away from them, but as long as we were there, Dapple wasn't there, and if they weren't working, we were winning. That was it. If they weren't working, we were winning. And we won a lot. We didn't lose at Standing Rock. This is a picture of a teepee frame that we built that day to pray 
All of those little colored things you see tied around the teepee poles, those are prayer ties. It's little balls of tobacco, and every one has been tied with a prayer for our safety, for the safety of our elders, for the, for, for the safety of the earth on Shemakai. That's what this was about. And when they came in, this is the first time I saw them really react violently. They started throwing people around. This grandmother right here, Grandmother Teresa Black Owl, she was there with her chanupa, her sacred pipe. It was loaded. It was connected. She was going to pray with these people. They arrested Grandma. They took her chanupa away from her and disconnected it. That's something you just don't do. This is a violation of the Religious Freedoms Act. This is her religion. They had no business taking that sacred item away from her. <laughs> this young girl was kneeling right next to Grandma. She was on her knees when they picked her up. They jerked her up. She said something. Whoop, what did I do? She said something to the cop, and then they threw her down. This big, burly son of a, son of a gun jumps up on her and puts his knee in her back, and that's the way they held her down to handcuff her. This is the most lawless operation on the part of a law enforcement agency I've ever seen in my life. Oh, come on now. There you go. They said that we blocked the roads. We didn't block the road. They brought their tanks in here. Look at the weaponry they're standing there with. Not one of us has a weapon. Nothing, we had nothing harder in our hand than the sacred pipe or an eagle feather. That's what they came after us with. They said we blocked the road. We didn't block the road. Um, this is also the first time that Sheriff Kyle Kirschmeyer used the word riot. He said, this was a riot. These people are out of control. This is a riotous act. We never rioted, but I found out later what that was about. In the insurance policy, there's only two things that they can um, file an insurance claim for loss of production. One is a natural disaster, and the other is a riot. That's why Kyle Kirschmeyer used the word riot. This is November the 20th. This is, this is at the Backwater Bridge. We're getting close. Okay. Um, this, if any, how many veterans in the room? Do you know what, if you've been in a firefight, you know what a firefight looks like? That's what we were up against. I call this photograph tarps against tanks. They've got a piece of plywood holding uh, to, to block the water off of the warriors there. Tear gas everywhere. You see them launching these things into the air. They told us that they were, they were only using the fire hoses to put out fires that were, that were in the grass out there. But look at the photograph. There are no fires. The only fires that night is when they put their projectiles into the grass and they lit the fires. And, of course, we used them to get warm by. <laughs> That's Turtle Island. And it's not just a piece of dirt. Everywhere those cars are sitting up there are on graves. They're on ancestors. And we know who some of these people are. This is not just about an environmental issue. This is treaty rights abuse. This is, this is the, the complete abandonment of behavior when it comes to the treaties with these people. The treaties are international treaties. They supersede the United States Constitution. We have no constitutional right to go out there and do what we're doing today. This is wrong on so many levels. We thought, like I said, we thought we were going to be safe over in Sachangu until the last day. And then when they came in on us, it was, it was altogether a different world. BIA came into our camp and they said, yes, the tribal council has approved this. You have to go. They evicted us in one of the worst blizzards in, in, the, in recent history up there. This was just not humane. We need people in the outside. We need people on the backside of these fights too. You don't have to be a frontline fighter to be a water protector. I want y'all to do something for me. Our mantra, our war cry was Mani Wichoni. The word is M-N-I. Mani. Say it with me. Mani. Wichoni. Mani Wichoni. Water is life. Say it again. Mani Wichoni. Mani Wichoni. 
Maniwachani. Welcome to Tonka. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. We're uh, getting crowded for time, but we have one more speaker, and his name is uh, Levi Rickert. He's f not far from here. He's in this community, and he was still here the other night. He's a publisher of the uh, Navy News Online, and he'll have some stories, but I believe he was up at uh, Standing Rock as well. So let's welcome uh, Levi for a few comments. Good afternoon. I promise you I'll be short. Uh, Lee and John are two acts that are difficult to follow. <laughs> I actually, as the publisher editor of Native News Online, had the honor to cover what I would term as the largest American Indian story during the last hundred years. Hundred or tens, of, not hundreds, but tens of thousands of American Indians and our allies went to Standing Rock over the course of, I would say started last April technically, but really accelerated in August and through February, like the third week of February. I've had the privilege of covering stories here locally when the local Indian community protested down at Rosa Park Circle protests outside Chase Bank at the Calder Plaza, at the state capitol in Lansing, 60 some miles from here, and two large protests in Washington, D.C., the latest of which last month, well, two months ago, should I say, March 9th, 10,000 American Indians marched on the streets of Washington. So as a journalist, I've actually had the privilege of, of covering that story. But I think that beyond Standing Rock, Lee and I were talking about that earlier today. It's kind of like, where do we go from here? What do we do next? The energy synergy that happened at Standing Rock. I saw an awakening of a new generation of American Indians who were looking for a cause. They were proud to be native. And John alluded to the fact some of them wanted to fight. I had a veteran tell me, I was there the weekend the veterans were there. He said, they're telling us to pray. We can pray at home. Yeah. We want action. They wanted to take that bridge back. And so, as a journalist, I have to back up. I have to remove myself from the situation. And I love Lee Sprague. He and I are even distant cousins. But he was feeding me, he's a source, he was feeding me real-time news. We were up almost all night long the night that the rubber bullets were, and the water cannons were going off covering stories. It was a major, major story. And as a journalist, I would get emails from around the world, people from New Zealand, Journalists from Australia, journalists from France, saying, well, one, thanking Native News Online for covering it, because what they, we were given the different spin. Maybe we were given the Indian side of the story. And I like to tell young people who are Native, it's time for us to tell our stories. We don't like how our stories were told, or have been told, through Hollywood pictures, American literature, in American history books, if we're even in there anymore. We don't like it. So it's our time to tell our stories. And that's why when I say I felt an honor, a privilege to be able to cover this, I know inside of me, and I've talked to two book editors, or two, two book publishers, there's one or two books inside of my head 
Maybe a video. Lee and I were talking about that today. But what really, where we go from here is what's important. Because we saw American Indians who live on third world living conditions on many of our reservations without running water, electricity in their homes. But we saw them at Standing Rock with a sense of purpose. And when I say an awakening for a new generation, that was really true. So what do we do next? How do we get people like you, the allies, to help us? And as I said the other night, it's not just about us. Yes, it's horrible that they desecrated graves at Standing Rock. Bulldozed through graves. That's horrible. Because if I was on a bulldozer in a local cemetery here in Grand Rapids, I would be arrested. I would be put on the front page of the Grand Rapids press. I would be a monster. But this oil company and their contractors, their subcontractors, were able to do that and get by with it. And we as Americans get so concerned about the human rights violations in Syria. Yes, they're horrible. But you know what? As a native person, as an American, we are dual citizens. I am a citizen of the United States of America. I am a citizen of the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation. But as a dual citizen, I get upset about what happens to my people in 2016, 2017. And it happens now. But it's, and we see what's happening with government. <clears throat> And I know in some organizations that are nonprofit, you have to be very careful to talk about government. But as a native person, and what's really ironic is, how many of you know the American Indians fight at a higher percentage in the military than any racial ethnic group in the United States? How many of you knew that? True statement. And that sometimes is very confusing because we have every right to be upset about what happened to us historically and even now. Just last week, I ran a story. Donald Trump attaches to the budget bill that Congress passed last week that his administration retains the right to hold back 640 no, excuse me, $654 million of American Indian um, block grant funding. He retains that right. That same piece of addendum that he put in this budget, he retains the right to hold back money from the black, historically black colleges. Because the GOP are afraid that we're getting something as people of color that nobody else is getting. You shouldn't get that. Why are they getting it? So we natives maintain it's not about race. And it has several, when I say several, U.S. Supreme Court cases have, have held us up that we are political entities. We're domesticated nations within the nation. It goes way back to the Marshall case back in 1830s. That's, that was the first time. And John Marshall said, they are domesticated nations. They have every right for their sovereignty. We have treaties. So we are a political entity. But where do we go from now? We resist. And we fight. And all across this country, as John said, all the pipelines and the various energy initiatives are attaching themselves to Standing Rock. And I'll say this, that the jury is still out. Scholars will be writing about Standing Rock for many years and maybe even decades. They will study it in colleges and universities. What went right? What went wrong? Should the tribal council have told everybody to go home? But I'm not here to talk about that. 
I'm talking about what do we do next? And I'm going to use the word resist. And I didn't invent that word because it's out there now in this country. We who care about the environment, we have got to resist. We have got to hold on to what we can hold on during the next four years. And I tell this to kids, I, I write this, if you don't think it matters who the President of the United States is, you have every reason to think again. So with that, I'm going to close. Keep up the fight. Keep up the resistance. And thank you for supporting those. As Lee thanked you, thank you for helping those at Standing Rock. It was a big thing, and it's going to be as history unfolds, We'll know more and more about it. We don't have all the answers now. Thank you very much. Miigwech. Thank you. Well, we're out of time. I thought we'd have time for some questions. But, um, you know, what everybody said up here today is we need to be at the table and not on the menu. And, and everybody has to be that way. When you're in your communities talking about issues with a river or a lake, be at the table so you know what's going on, so you're not on the menu and you have to deal with it later. And that's a term I use regularly from a great friend of mine whose name is Bob Goff. Be at the table, not on the menu. I also need to give credit to him to the, to the map that I had up there earlier. Uh, I had invited him to come and speak eloquently as these gentlemen, but he was conflicted and he couldn't be here. But, you know, I think we all need to team up. My, my takeaway on this is that the tribe's sovereignty and government-to-government -government relationships with the government, they're now more in a position to do that than ever before. And if that helps your cause, talk to your local tribe. See what goes on there. And don't just go there to ask for something or to explain something. Go to some other functions. Go to the powwow. Go to a ceremony. Ask what's going on. How do they live? And so when, they, when that happens, they welcome you in the community, then you become inseparable team, team members. So we're 557 tribes, but we're not foreigners, but sometimes we're treated that way. So with that, have a great conference. I appreciate being here. And um, there's just so much that went on in this room today that it's just hard to absorb all of it. But it's good vibes. Rally. Oh!